I'm excited today. We're in, we're in a two-week uh, series that we do once a year, if you're new, that we call our REACH series. And uh, what that means is we just talk about some of, of, of the things that have happened and, and a little bit about where we're headed. And we make a commitment as a church family to say, hey, we're going to be generous, all of us together, and me, me and Hope. And I, w- I would challenge you, you got this little card on your seat, pray over that this week and ask God, God, how would you want me and my family to be generous this year? Uh, me and, and me and Hope are going to pray about that as well and give our uh, biggest REACH offering and uh, and commitment for the year that we've ever done. And so pray, pray over that this week. And if, if you're new today, we're a church that uh, we're all about changed lives. We believe that Jesus is the one that changes lives. It's not a person. It's not a program. Uh, it's Jesus. He's the savior of the world. He is God and he changes lives. And we're committed to do everything we can to worship him and to build a healthy individual families and church family and to reach people with that message of Jesus and I, I want to share for a moment where uh, a few of the things about where we've been this past year in 2022. And if you go to our website after church today, you can find uh, our Change Life report on there uh, from 2022. It's, it's radiantchurch.com slash reach that you can find that on there. But in 2022, uh, as, as far as as many as we know, and I know there's more than this, but there were 1,058 people across our campuses that made a decision to follow Jesus and make him the Lord of their life. And... It's really cool, some of the stories that we've heard globally. There's countless people through missionaries that we support that have made decisions in different places all over the world, some of the furthest reaching places that have been impacted by the message of Jesus. And in the last uh, 12 Wednesday baptism service nights that we've had, and then a few at our other campuses, there's 242 people that have said, I wanna get baptized and I wanna leave the old behind, the new has come, and they've, they've made that public declaration through baptism in these last 12 services that we've had powerful. And then, and, and then also this last year, we've seen uh, over 1,200 families that, that received f- food from our Change Life Center. We've seen over 1,200 families that received clothing from our Change Life Center, and that's been impactful for uh, the surrounding communities. And, and then several weeks ago, I'm really excited today to tell you that we started a new campus in El Mirage, and we're now one church with four locations, four campuses, reaching the valley with the love of Jesus. And, uh, you know, there's community and there's life change that's happening here in Surprise, at Sun City, in North Phoenix, at our Deer Valley campus, and also now in El Mirage. And I'm just excited uh, to see what God has already done, but I'm more excited to see what he's going to continue to do in and through us as a church family. And, and, and here's the thing about giving you some of those numbers is, is these numbers matter because people matter. And every single person matters. Every individual story, you in the room today, people that haven't met you yet, people that haven't met you, met Jesus yet, they matter to God. What does it say in John 3? That Jesus so loved the world that he came so that anybody who would believe would have eternal life. And that's the message that we're here for as a church. And I want to point out something as well this morning that you'll see uh, on our website under our reach area. We've been doing uh, what we would call Second Saturdays for quite a while now. And uh, what we're going to do as a church family is we're going to start to refer to those weekends as reach weekends. And you'd say, why? What's the point? Well, first, uh, the purpose, I want to keep the purpose in front of us that the idea of what we're doing on these weekends when we're either serving an organization or we're doing something on a campus, uh, the whole idea is that we're reaching people that, 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 that are hurting. We're reaching people that maybe they're hopeless at this point in their life. We're reaching people that are in need of something different, in need of a change, or we're supporting someone on their journey of life and, and, and continuing to reach people with the message of Jesus. Secondly, uh, sometimes there's a, there's a weekend uh, that works best that's not actually on the second Saturday of the month. And so that creates the opportunity for us to say, hey, maybe we need to do it on the first or the third week, or, or maybe it's night to shine that's on a Friday and it's not actually on a Saturday because some of those weekends are not just Saturday. They bleed into Sunday or they're on Friday or, or it, ha- it has something to do with our services as well. And so we're gonna refer to those weekends as reach weekends. You'll see those on our website. And I'm just excited to continue to, 
utilize uh, our campuses to the best of our ability and, and, and host people and host services and events and, and ultimately just uh, make disciples and create a place where people can come together and worship God and, and build community. And I'm also excited to stay connected to our partners all over the valley that are working holistically to transform lives and bring people out of maybe things that they're going through or poverty or, or whatever different situation in life. We're partnering with people that are getting it right as a church. And so can you tell that I'm excited about what God's doing and what he's going to do in our church family? So if you're taking notes today, I want to spend the next few minutes, and it's kind of like uh, you're jumping on a jet ski with me, and I'm hitting the gas, and we're just cruising real fast through this thing. So uh, buckle up real quick. But if you're taking notes, I'm going to call uh, the next few minutes, nothing is impossible. Nothing's impossible. And here's the idea that I'm getting at this morning. When we are unified, nothing's impossible. I love just considering and thinking about the power of our God sometimes. In Ephesians 3.20, one of my favorite verses, it says this, now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine according to his power that's at work within us. You serve a God that he's not just powerful, he's more powerful than you can even imagine in your brain. That's a big God. Anybody know that you serve a big God this morning? (laughs) You know, I love some of the moments in Jesus' life and, and all the different stories. And there, there was one moment in scripture where he was teaching uh, people. He was teaching some of his followers and other people that were interested to hear. And, and he gave some comments on eternal life. And this is Matthew 18 and 19. And uh, the disciples, after some of these comments, they came away uh, asking Jesus, it seems kind of difficult to be saved. Like, how can you even be saved? And in Matthew 19, 26, this was Jesus' response. He looked at him and said, with man, it's impossible, but with God, all things are possible. Can I tell you that that principle is true across the board about your God, that with God, all things are possible, that with God, restoration in your life is possible, that with God, uh, fixing your family is possible, that with God, getting out of addiction is possible, that with God, being saved and having hope and having life change is possible. That's the power of your God. So the idea today, when we're unified under God, nothing is impossible. You know, God, uh, he exemplifies this idea of unity in and of himself. When you look at this uh, trinity, the triune God, Father, Son, and Spirit in perfect unity, Jesus, what did, what did he say in scripture? He said, I do what I see the Father doing. In other words, we are in perfect unity. We created this concept of unity, and we created people to be in, in unity with the one true God. And, and on a uh, uh, Vision Sunday, I, w- I want to uh, shift a little bit. On Vision Sunday, we, we talked about the story of Abraham. And we talked about this, this, this mission that we have when we're serving God to, to, uh, to worship him and to build a healthy church family and individual families and to reach people. And, and we believe that Jesus will continue to work in us and through us when we do that. But there's a story right before Abraham that I wanna bring up for just a moment this morning. In Genesis chapter 11, if you have a Bible, you can uh, get it out and look at it quickly with me. Anybody have a Bible in church on a Sunday morning? I'm, I'm telling, there's something about that smell of, of a fake leather Bible on a Sunday morning at church. If you don't have one, we'd love to give you one. But I want to look at Genesis 11, verse 1 to 9 for just a minute. And I'm just going to read all the way through it and give you a few thoughts uh, this morning. And we'll move into finishing Acts as well in chapter 10 that we started this last week. But it says this in Genesis uh, Genesis 11, verse 1 to 9. It says, the whole earth had one language and the same words. And as people migrated from the east, they found a plain in the land of Shinar and settled there. They said to one another, come, let us make bricks and burn them thoroughly. And they had brick for stone and and bitumen for mortar. And they said, come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower with its top in the heavens. And let us make a name for ourselves, lest we be dispersed over the face of the whole earth. And the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the children of man had built. And the Lord said, behold, they're one people and they all have, they have all one language. And this is only the beginning of what they'll do. And nothing that they propose to do will now be impossible for them. Verse 7, it says, Come, let us go down and confuse their language so they may not understand one another's speech. 
The Lord dispersed them over the face of the earth. They left off building the city. Therefore, its name was called Babel because the Lord confused the language of all the earth and the Lord dispersed them over the face of all the earth. So when we look at a story like this, it's, it's an interesting story. And, and I want, I'm gonna give you just some short context today. Here's the bottom line is this, this moment, these people, it was a misguided attempt at true unity. And there's a lot of historical and cultural nuance to this story, and I don't have time to get into all of it today, but the idea is in, in, the, in this story is that making a name for themselves, that wasn't really the problem. In fact, what did God promise Abram? He said, hey, I'm gonna make a name for you, and I'm gonna make a great nation out of you. The unity of people wasn't the problem. The problem is the disobedience to the call of God for humanity and the direction that they were going that was gonna become the wrong type of unity. Because what, what they were doing in this story is essentially they were beginning to unify around themselves. They were gonna deify their own city, deify their own culture, and it was gonna ultimately lead them away from the God who created them and his plan for all people throughout history. It was gonna become kind of like this false Eden or this false uh, utopia. And what you need to know today, church, is, is, is when we look in the scripture in Genesis 1, Genesis 2, every single human was created in the image of God. Maybe you came in today and, and you don't realize that. You were made in the image of God. You were made with purpose. You have a calling on your life. And in Genesis 1.28, God gives an interesting command for humanity. He says, hey, be fruitful and multiply. Anybody thankful for that command in your marriage life? God told humanity from the start, hey, fill the earth by building families. And we see instead in scripture sometimes, often, that they started to build upon violence instead of building healthy families. But God was interested in restoration. And let me just stop for a second. Anybody thankful for a but God moment in your life where he showed up and impacted your story and, and maybe you were headed this way and he kind of just kicked you in the can real quick and said, hey, I'm gonna, I'm gonna redirect you because I got a plan for you. I got better things in store for you. So God sees what they're doing and he has restoration in mind and, and ultimately we know through Abraham and through the family lines all the way up to Jesus that full restoration was the plan and now Jesus is available to any person that would believe. But in the story of Babel, there's this unified people that are saying, we're no longer gonna build diverse families and scatter across the earth and unify around the one true God, but we'll just unify around ourselves and we'll stay in one spot and we're gonna be good. And so this mix-up of languages that we see in Babel is actually an act of mercy from God to keep humanity on track. Thank God that there's been some moments where he said, hey, I'm gonna keep you on track. I'm gonna send somebody in your life to say, what are you doing, man? I'm gonna, I'm gonna send a situation to keep you on track. Here's the focus, though, today, and, and why I bring this story up is this Babel story is powerful because it gives us some insight early on in scripture that when we're unified as people, it's really powerful. God said in verse six, nothing that they propose is gonna be impossible for them. He's not saying like they're gonna be more powerful than me. Obviously, he's the creator of the universe. He knows that, but he's speaking to the power of unity. And the truth is, is God does want humanity to be unified, but he wants us to be unified in the right direction. He wants us to be unified under his original design for us as people. And here's the principle today that we can take from the story in Genesis is unity without God ultimately leads to chaos. This applies to really every area of life. It applies to the church. And, and I'm afraid to say that there are some churches in our world that have unified around things that are extra biblical or are not true to scripture and it's ultimately gonna lead them to chaos. It's true about your family. It's true about your marriage. If you're unified around things other than God and his commands and his principle, it's gonna lead you to chaos. You, you might say, man, I'm the most unified I've ever been in my marriage, but if you really dig down deep, really you're just unified in the pursuit of money or the pursuit of something that's not eternal, and ultimately, at some point in your life, it's gonna lead to pain and chaos. Maybe you'd say, if we're being honest, we're unified in the fact that we're trying to live vicariously through our kids. We never won state, but I know my son's gonna win state someday. Ultimately, it's gonna lead to pain and chaos. 
What I'm trying to tell you is God has to be the center of your lifestyle and the other things are going to fall into place as he intended as you follow him and put him first in your life. You know, this, this, this Babel narrative that we see in Genesis, uh, this attempt at unity, uh, ultimately, if God had let them just go, it would have ended in oppression and, and rejection and chaos and pain and sin and all of this stuff. Because in the absence of God's presence, any human or, or group of humans, we attempt to insert ourselves in this divine ordering role in our sin and our corruption. The scripture tells us every person has sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. This sin and corruption in our life, inevitably, it it means that sin and corruption will invade and pervade and affect the whole thing in whatever our pursuits are. So God's choice to come down and say, hey, I'm gonna get these people back on track, it's actually liberating them from their own pride, their own things that would become their destruction. And, and I want you to think with me for a second. This is interesting. We see in our world today, if you skip ahead to 2023 where we're at, there's a lot of technological advances. Any, anybody thankful for some technology that makes your life easier? Like, I was thinking this morning, I got a trash can that I just wave over it and it opens and it's, it's amazing. Like, they didn't have that in the Bible. It's crazy. Anyways, that's probably the worst example of technology to bring up, but there's some cool stuff. Someone's like, you could have talked about Teslas or whatever. But in many ways in our world, when you look at AI and artificial, artificial intelligence, you look at... Uh, Automated translating services, I think is interesting, directly integrated into your phone, there's this man-made reversal of Babel, and I, I, I can confidently, as a person, I can walk up to any person that doesn't speak English, if I have an internet connection and my phone, and I can translate, and they can translate, and I can have a full conversation with them. It's interesting, and, and technology, when you look at it in many ways, it's hurting us as much as it's making our lives better, if we're being real. Look at our world today, anxiety and depression and suicidal ideation is through the roof. In some parts of the world, I mean, you look at Japan, it's, it's proven to be reducing birth rates and causing all kinds of social problems. And we're more interconnected than we've ever been in our world, and yet we're more increasingly lonely and isolated than ever before. In some ways, it's Babel in action where we've ascended to the heavens so that nothing's impossible and yet we've created something that's contributed to our own pain and disorderedness. And I'm sharing this today. Please don't take this and say, I knew it all along. We were all supposed to be Amish. Throw your phone in the trash. Everybody get on wagons today. That's not what I'm saying. I'm just pointing out the fact that if we're not careful, we have to be careful in what we're unified around in what we are led by above everything else, in what we're spending all of our time on. I'm telling you, church, God has got to be the focus. He's got to be the end game. He's got to be the ultimate guide of our lives. You know, when I look at, at, at some of our, and, and I realize that there is very real diagnosis of depression and different things like that. I am not discounting that today. But when I look at some of our teenagers, I, I, and I know through studies that this has now been proven, that some of our teenagers, they get, they get um, diagnosed, and, and it's not just teenagers, it's anybody in our world today, they get diagnosed with things and, and, and certain forms of depression. And the problem is that they're spending nine hours on their phone every single day. And studies have shown how detrimental that has been to our minds and our social skills and our development as people, we weren't designed for that. And so I would just say is, what's taking the most time in your life? Where's your focus every day? Where, where are most of your hours spent at? I, I would also say today, look, look at our country. How, how many people would love unity in our country? Okay, seven people, that's awesome, all right, cool. Well, there's a few of us that would love to see unity. I, I've always loved that statement, united we stand and divided we fall. But here's the thing, church, we're still going to fall if we're united around things that don't match what we were founded on, which is the Bible and the principles of God and the truth of Scripture. You know, in some ways, we've seen some forced elements of unity, whether, whether it's from, you know, one group or, 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 or government people or whatever that, that have said, if you do this, we're unified. And, and, and it's 
in some ways there have been some things that are opposite of the truth of God, opposite of scripture, and ultimately when we gather and unify around those things, they will lead to our destruction and pain and oppression and chaos. We have to be unified around the principles of God. I'm telling you, as a church, and and I'm not saying we have to all of a sudden expect every uh, person that doesn't know Jesus yet to act like Jesus. They don't know him yet. But as a church and people that have met him in the room, we got to come around the truth. And when we do that, we're going to see the blessing of God in our families. We're going to see the blessing of God in our church family. And it's going to bleed into our nation and impact the people in our lives. So... You walked into the room today and you would say, man, I want to fix my marriage. I got problems. I want to fix my kids. I got problems. I want want to fix my life. I, I got issues going on. If you would make a commitment and unify around the truth, not your truth, not your feelings, not something that somebody randomly said years ago, but the truth of scripture, I'm telling you, when you would do that, God is going to move in your life. He's going to help you move forward. He's going to bring you out of whatever you're walking through today. And when we do that, nothing's impossible. The power of God at work. I, I heard a story that I want to share with you. There, there was uh, this old man that, that he had three sons. And these sons, they were, I mean, they were hardworking guys. They, they were in construction. They were strong guys. And they constantly argued with each other. I mean, anybody have kids that they constantly, don't raise your hand. They con- th- this guy, And maybe just elbow your kid real quick, like, you know, but no one else can know. They constantly argued. And this guy, he he, he got sick of it one day, and he told all of his sons, hey, can you please stop fighting? And none of them listened. They kept arguing. And so the old man, he's like, okay, I got to teach these guys a lesson somehow, something practical. And he he gets all of his sons, and, and he gives each of them their own bundle of sticks, he says, well, here's what I want you to do. I want you to separate every individual stick from your bundle, and I want you to break it in half. And the one who can do it fastest, uh, you get a Chick-fil-A gift card. And uh, the, these, these guys, they love Chick-fil-A. They were hungry. They, they loved eating lunch on the construction job at Chick-fil-A. And so, so they're all excited, and they're like, I'm going to win this gift card, man. And, and, and they start separating the sticks, and they break them all individually into two pieces. And then uh, they get to the end of it, and they're all just still quarreling and arguing about who finished first. So the old man, he's like, I gotcha, the game's not over. And and, and he gives them a bundle of sticks again, each of them, this bundle of sticks. And he says, hey, now what you need to do, you you have to just do it by yourself, bare hands, no help. What you need to do is you cannot separate these sticks. Keep this bundle together, but I still want you to break the entire thing in half. And so these sons are like, okay, we'll try it. Yeah, we're pretty strong, guys. We we got it. This is easy. And and they go out and they try to break these bundles of sticks. And these, I mean, these guys are, they're trying to break it on their leg. They're throwing it against the wall. They're putting it on their head, trying to, they cannot break this bundle of sticks. They go back to their dad and they're like, dad, we couldn't, none of us could do it. We're failures, all this stuff. And he tells his sons, hey, you could, you could easily, obviously break those sticks by separating them individually. But when it comes to the bundle, Look what happens. You couldn't do it. Because when you combine something, when there's something that's unified, it's, it's almost impossible to break anything with unity in your own strength. He said, sons, if all three of you guys could quit the way that you're living right now and stay united, there's no force that can harm you. It's going to be powerful. And here's why I share that today. We were never meant to live life alone. We were never meant to live life isolated. We were meant to live as a church family. And if you're in the room, I'm telling you, there's gonna be some times in your life, if you haven't had them already, where you need a family around you. You need to work and to live in unity. You need some people so that, so that you, by yourself, you break a lot easier than when you have a church family behind you. We were created to do life together. It's our biggest strength. There's a parent in the room that, that, that you've, or, or a son or a daughter in the room that you have isolated yourself, you've pushed everybody away, and you're like, I can do it on my own. Can I tell you, you cannot do it on your own, and you weren't made to do it on your own. We need each other. We need the unity of God, and we need the unity with each other. And I'm telling you, it's powerful when people are unified under the purpose and the plan of God. So real quick. Now I want to fast forward, like just do the fast forward in your mind. Fast forward real quick. Okay, now we're in the New Testament. We look at Genesis. Now Jesus is on the scene. The Savior of the world is on the scene. And Jesus has this long prayer in John chapter 17. And you can read all of it later, but I just want to give you two verses. 
He said, I'm praying not only for these disciples, but also for all who will ever believe in me through their message. I pray that they will all be one. In other words, they'll all be unified just as you and I are one, Father. As you are in me, Father, and I am in you. And may they be in us so that the world will believe that you sent me. Can I tell you, when you have a unified church, the world comes and they believe that Jesus sent him. There's something different about people that look different, smell different, are from different backgrounds. But when they're unified, it is a message to the world that there's a God. Jesus wants us to live in unity under his guidance. When we do, we start to hit that nothing is impossible through God type of stride in our lives, going in the right direction. Now, I wanna quickly take you back to Acts, and we started Acts chapter 10 this last week, and I'm gonna finish it real quick right here. If you weren't here, basically what was happening is Peter and Cornelius, a Jew and a Gentile, they both separately have these visions And basically, Cornelius, uh, he doesn't know Jesus yet, but he's been praying and and seeking God. And Peter gets sent on this mission to Cornelius' house. And Peter's realizing that the gospel, the good news, is now not just for the Jews. It's for everybody. Can I just pause and tell somebody in the room? The gospel is for everybody. It's for you today. If you came in the room and you feel like, I've done too much, I've had too many mistakes, it's for you. It's good news. The gospel's for the person at work that you don't like very much. (laughs) Gospel's for the person that you do like. It's for everybody. So Acts chapter 10, what's happening in verse 34, I'm gonna skip to verse 34. This is where we left off this last week. Peter opened his mouth and he says, truly, I understand that God shows no partiality. God doesn't show favoritism. I would say that he does show favoritism to everybody. You're his favorite. (laughs) He doesn't show partiality in every nation. Anyone who fears him and does what's right is acceptable to him As for the word that he sent to Israel, preaching good news of peace through Jesus, he is Lord of all. You yourselves know what happened. And Peter, he explains some of what happened to Jesus and he's telling uh, the people, hey, you know about this guy, but you don't know yet. And I'm telling you right now, he's the savior of the world. He's Lord of all. He's the God. He's the creator. He's the Messiah. And watch this in verse 40. It says, God raised him on the third day and made him to appear and then, it, and then Peter says a couple more comments. In verse 42, it says, he commanded us to preach to the people and testify that he's the one, the judge of the living and the dead. In other words, he's the judge. He's the creator. He is God. In verse 44, verse 43, sorry, this is powerful. It says, everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. Somebody today, you came in the room, and can I just encourage you and tell you, I'm gonna give you an opportunity in just a couple minutes, but you need to receive that forgiveness of all of your mistakes and move forward and walk into the new life that Jesus has for you and have hope for eternity when you walk out of this room today. Maybe you're watching online, you need to make that decision today. Verse 44 says, Peter was saying these things, powerful moment, this huge house full of Cornelius and all all of his family, all of his people, all the people that worked for him. It says all, the, the Holy Spirit fell on all who heard the word and the believers among the circumcised, that's the Jewish people, they were shocked. They were amazed because the Holy Spirit was being poured out even on the Gentiles. Can I tell you that that the Holy Spirit will be poured out on somebody that believes in Jesus? I'm telling you, the person that you think has no chance, God's Spirit wants to work and pour out on their life. Verse 46, it says they were hearing them speaking in tongues and they were extolling God. They were praising God. And then Peter declared, can Anyone withhold water for baptizing these people who've received the Holy Spirit just as we have? And then he commands them to be baptized. So they, they know Jesus, they've been filled with the Holy Spirit, and now they're getting baptized, leaving the old behind. The new has come. Can I tell you, if, if you haven't been baptized, you need to get baptized. Jesus commands us to do that. Leave behind that old man. And I just wanna be clear today, as a church, as long as, 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 as I'm here and, and I'm a part of this thing, we're gonna to continue to preach Jesus and see people get saved. We're gonna to continue to baptize people. We're gonna to continue to pray that the Holy Spirit would be poured out so that we could see his power at work in our lives and through our lives. We're gonna keep the main thing the main thing is what I'm trying to tell you today. You know, the bottom line in this story of Acts is that through Cornelius and Peter, they, we talked about it last week that they, there was a hunger for the things of God 
And now they're being obedient to his guidance, Peter to speak the word, Cornelius to respond to it. Because of that, lives are being changed. Restoration is happening. The filling of the spirit, baptism. And and here's the second principle I want you to walk away with today is that unity with God, true unity with God is a witness to the world. Jesus prayed it, and we see it all through the book of Acts that it's happening. The church is devoted to one another. The church is growing. They're worshiping. They're, they're doing life together. They're, they're a light in a dark world. And, and when we stay unified under God's word, we become a witness of this new way to be human. All of us in the room, we got somebody in our life that, that, that we could think of or we're praying for that need that, that power of Jesus, that new way to be human. I'm telling you, if we could stay unified, if we could build each other up, if we could become better disciples, he is going to use your story, my story, to impact those people that are part of our family and friends and coworkers in our world. I wanna give you one more thought today as well that God also, he desires to unify his people around his purposes. It's just a true principle. He he wants our church to unify around his purposes. What's his desire? That we would be one with him, united with him, that we would be one with each other under his plan, ultimately to become better disciples and to make more disciples, to build his church family. That's what we're here for. That's what we're doing as a church. Any, anybody thankful today that God made it clear in scripture what we need to do? Hey, follow me and lead more people to me. Make it to heaven. Take as many people as we can with us. That's what we're working to do as a church. And, and you may be here today and you maybe have been here for a while and you would say, okay, what other specifics are we unifying around at Radiant Church in 2023? What are the things that we're praying for? How can I be generous? How can I pray for uh, people and for the ministries? I would say, number one, we need to continue to reach people globally in a greater way than we ever have through our missionary partners. I'm proud of our teams that go out every year that are part of those trips, but, but I wonder, we, we support around 100 missionaries and, and we're about halfway to the point of having a missionary in every country of the world. I wonder if we were a people that could look in the future and say, God, would you help us to support enough people so that we could reach every tribe, every tongue, every nation and have somebody that's in every country of the world. That'd be powerful. Secondly, I, I'd say we're, we gotta do everything we can to win a city to Jesus. I believe that we're strategically planted right here, right now. It's not a mistake that you're living in Surprise or North Phoenix or Glendale or or Sun City or El Mirage or wherever you're from. It is not a mistake that God has you in that place for this time, for such a time as this. And, And I just believe as I was praying that it's time for us to continue to water what's going on and grow some healthy roots and deepen our impact right here in each of our campuses for every generation. We're a church that, man, we, you pray with me this year that we would in a greater way help kids to have an encounter with the living God. We, we gotta do something to reverse where we're headed in some ways so that kids would encounter God at a young age, so that youth could encounter God, so that young adults, so that adults and families and young families and old families and, every, and, and people that, that maybe are retired, every generation needs the power of Jesus in their life. We're at church for every generation. You know, I wanna just give you a couple uh, thoughts on where we've been this last year. We've had, uh, we've had some deferred maintenance on campuses. And so we've invested in fixing the parking lot and some paint and other things that are still ongoing right now. And we still have some other things ahead. And some of our chairs are end of life. We've never replaced carpet, things like that. And, and, and that's part of our generosity as a church. But we, we also have a need to create some great spaces for kids and for youth all across our campuses. There's some deferred things and some things that we need to do. And and ultimately, the reason for doing that is so that kids could build community and encounter the living God. And so we need to commit to doing that as a church. And I also, today, I wonder what it would look like to utilize our space, uh, even, even like under our solar panels out here, so that people could be here during the week, church between the Sundays, building relationships, sand volleyball. I wonder what it would look like if there was like pickleball where we could do tournaments out there. I'm just saying for my pickleball fans in the room. This has gotta be a place at all of our campuses where people can gather and have groups and find community and build relationships and go to recovery 
and be in services and all of the different things so that God can continue to grow us as better disciples and make more people that are disciples of him in a powerful way. And I believe it's gonna happen. The other thing I, I would say is we gotta continue to partner with our local organizations that we're, that, that we're in partnership with and help their programs like we never have before. We're, we're, we're partnered with some people that are getting it right and lives are being changed. It's also on my heart that we would, in a greater way, come alongside foster care and support group homes that need help and support some ministries that are working in foster care so that kids have a chance at life. You know, we're, one, we're Maricopa County is not a, the stats are not very good for the amount of people that are in foster care. We gotta be people that have a heart for the fatherless, the motherless. All this stuff that I'm mentioning, I mean, it takes us collectively coming together to make those things happen. And you would say, well, why are we doing that? Why do we care about our campuses? Why do we care about uh, local organizations? Why do we care about the, the, the different things that we do and on the reach weekends and all that? Because God loves people and God loves the people of Surprise. God loves the people of, of our Deer Valley campus in North Phoenix. God loves the people that are in Sun City. That I'm telling you, there are some people in our communities that their greatest years are still in front of them. And God wants wants to use us to be a part of pointing them to Jesus. God loves the people of El Mirage, where some, a lot of people would say, I don't want to go there. And we're saying, we do want to go there because there's some hurting, broken, hopeless people in all of our communities that need the message of Jesus that changes lives. You know, in El Mirage, we would, we would love to build someday. We're being wise stewards right now of the opportunity that we have to partner with the elementary school for a season, and we're gonna see what God does through that. Every, every need, everything that we bring up, every need that we have in our communities, it's, it's connected to an individual story of what God has done, and I believe what he will continue to do through our ministry as a church family. And you have a part of it. Every person has gifts and talents and things that they can be a part of it, that God is calling all of us to make an impact. You know, if, if you consider your own story, many of us in the room, maybe it was when you were younger, maybe it was recently, you've been impacted by somebody that said, hey, I, I'm gonna reach out to this person. I, you know, I may not look the same or be from the same background, but somebody reached out to you, somebody encouraged you, somebody invited you to something that, that it changed your life. Maybe you're in the room, there was somebody that was there when you were down and out at your lowest moment and somebody said, hey, I know a person that can change your life and his name is Jesus. Many of us in the room were impacted by going to a service or a recovery ministry or, or whatever that may have been, but if you would just consider that God has reached out to you, God has changed you, God has touched your life, and now he's saying, I wanna use you to be that same type of person for somebody else. I'm, I thank God every day for a church family that cares about the mission of God to reach people. We were meant to be a hospital for the broken so that people can find healing. I thank God for his healing in my life. Thank God for his healing in, in so many different stories and individuals online and in the room today. So I just ask you to pray with me this year and in the coming weeks that we could unite our impact in, in our community in a greater way than ever and that God would ultimately guide that and lead that. Because when we're unified with, with God's purpose, we're unified with each other, man, I'm telling you, nothing's impossible. I think we're gonna look back in 20 years and say, I, I can't believe what you did, God. It, was, it blew our minds. It was, it was like Ephesians. It was greater than we ever could have asked or imagined. I believe that for your individual family today. I wanna to talk to you real quick as I close and I'm gonna pray for you about the absence of unity. How many people you've, you've experienced the absence of unity, maybe in a family or at work, in a work environment? It's, it's a dangerous place to be. It's a painful place to be. You know, several centuries ago when, the, when China decided they wanted to secure their borders from invaders, they built the, what we know as the Great Wall of China and it was built to protect the border, and it's like over 1,500 miles long, and it was 12 to 40 feet wide, depending on where you were at. It was anywhere from 20 to 50 feet high off the ground, and this wall, it was, it was too high for 
enemies that long ago to try and scale and it was too thick to tear down and, and too long to try and just go around and, and they would put soldiers at different places on the wall and it was wide enough that they could have chariots up there and, and they could patrol and if there was like an attack somewhere, they could come from uh, both sides and protect it and easily get there and, and they were just, because they were up super high, it gave them a, it, this advantage over all their enemies and and basically they knew that they had protected their borders sufficiently against all their enemies. But it's interesting, in the first 100 years after the Great Wall of China was built, the nation was completely invaded three different times. You say, well, how was it invaded? Disunity. There was enemies that would bribe the gatekeepers and they would enter into the land undetected. There's disunity among the protectors of this country. I'll bring that up today to say that we as a church, as individual families, we gotta pray that God would help us to protect the unity he's given us as a group, he's given your individual family, that he, we, that he would even help us to protect that unity that we have with him and his word and that relationship that we have individually with God. I would say today, maybe some of us in the room, if you're, if you're honest today, you would say, I'm, man, I'm kind of like one of those gatekeepers that, that I've opened the, the, the gates of my life to compromise. That I, I, I would say, I'm, I'm not unified with God today. That I've, I've let the enemy into one area or certain areas or, or just completely into my life. That I, I'm, I haven't been walking with God. Or I have, I, there's, there's, a, there's a small area that I've let him take control of and I know that, that this path is not where I'm supposed to stay. I need to get back on track today. And I would just ask you to be honest with yourself. Have you let the enemy in? Have you compromised? Have you messed up in that area of unity in your life? Is the enemy getting a foothold? Can I tell you that today is a great day to get on track? There's no better morning than today to get back on track. So I'm gonna ask if you'd bow your heads, close your eyes in the room at all of our campuses, if you're online. If you would say today, if you're just honest with yourself and you say, I, I need the Lord's help today. I, I need him to, to clean me up and get me back on track. I need him to unify me with his word and with his people and with my family. I've, I've, I've compromised, I've let the enemy in. I've, I've made some mistakes. There's some recent things. I need the Lord's help today. If you would say that, I'm just gonna ask, would you just be bold and just slip up your hand? I just wanna see who I'm praying for. I need the Lord's help today. Hands all over the room. God, you see every hand in the room. Lord, I thank you for every person that's willing to respond. Lord, you see their heart. You see their willingness to respond. And Lord, I just pray by the power of your Holy Spirit that you would guide and you would help and you would convict and you would speak truth and you would be the helper that you say that you are in scripture, that you would give them wisdom beyond any wisdom that they've ever had. God, I pray for somebody in the room that you would connect them with the right people, for somebody that needs to come up today and respond to our Next Steps team, that you would help them to get back on track, for somebody that needs to get in the recovery ministry, I pray that they would take that step so that they can get on the right track, for somebody that needs to get in a life group and get some people around them that are gonna build them up and help them in their faith, I pray that you would do that today. And Lord, for every person that's responding, whether it's a family issue, personal issue, small thing, big thing, everything in between, I just ask for the power of your Holy Spirit so that we could be a people that live lives that are honoring to you. In the short time that we have, God, help us to live a life that honors you, that brings glory to your name. In Jesus' name. I believe there's a second group of people in the room, and you can keep your heads bowed if you want, but you're in here and you would say, I'm not walking with Jesus today. I need to make a decision to follow him. Maybe you've never made that decision. Uh, maybe you've walked away. Maybe you grew up and, and it was a religious thing for you. This is a relationship with the living God that Jesus offers because of what he did on the cross. And so if you're in the room today and you would, you would say, man, I've walked away or I've never uh, surrendered my life to Jesus or I, if, if my world ended today, I don't know that I'd be in heaven with him. Man, there, today is a great day to solidify your standing before God, that, that you would be made righteous before him, that you would be in eternity with him, that you would have a new life that the Bible describes. And so if you're in here today and you would say, I wanna make a decision to follow Jesus, I wanna come back to Jesus, I'm just gonna ask, would you be bold? Would you slip up your hand? I just wanna see who I'm praying for. I need Jesus today in my life. I wanna come back to Jesus. Thank you, I see you in the back and in the middle. Anybody else? Thank you. Awesome. 
Anybody else? One more second. Maybe you're online, maybe at one of our campuses. Greatest decision you could ever make in your life. If you raise your hand, just pray something kind of like this. Jesus, I need you today. Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross for the sin of the world, for my sin. Pray that you'd forgive me for the things that separate me from you. Jesus, today, I make you the Lord of my life in every area. Jesus, thank you for the new life that I now have. Jesus, I pray that you would fill me with your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.